couple of years, I pastored a church in uh, Toronto where uh, we had a senior's residence. And it was really interesting because I got to see uh, how older people are. And what I found is really there's no in-between. So I have a theory that when you're younger, and define, I don't know what younger is, but uh, it, it keeps getting older for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, for a while, you can kind of go along, and nobody really knows your spiritual condition. So it just goes, you know, people can look at you and say, seems like a nice person, seems like they're faithful at church, uh, kind of seems like they're okay. But there comes a time, and I discovered this, where when you get old, and I, for the sake of, I'm not even going to go there, uh, but let's just say people in a senior's home, it was very hard to find people that were, were like, these people are just in the middle. So I found there was a group of people, with apologies to the people over this side, um, there were people who went one direction, and that direction was grumpy. Uh, you, they became older, and their, their souls just seemed brittle. Uh, have you ever met a senior like that? And they're just like, there's not a lot of joy. It, it just felt like uh, what they said came out, and often it was critical. And it just felt like, my theory is that you can hide that for a while, you know, when you're younger, but eventually as you get older, uh, stuff's going to become more obvious, and it's just going to come out. So who you were in secret is going to come out and be obvious to everybody. But there's this other group of people that I met, um, and I found the older they get, it's almost like the sweeter they get, the godlier they get. Um, they're just more encouraging. So we had somebody come to our church. He was a uh, one of the uh, big guys in our denomination, the fellowship of evangelical Baptist churches. He had been a church planter. He had been president of the denomination. Uh, he was a like, really big deal in his day. And he came to our church, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Just what I need is this old retired pastor who's going to sit there and tell me everything I'm doing wrong and how, how much better it was in his day. And, uh, you know, he came to our church. Do you know what I discovered? The whole time he was with us, never said a critical word. Whenever I was with him, I felt like I was in the presence of somebody who was walking with God. I just felt uh, that there was a lot that he could have criticized, and he chose not to. He chose to be gracious. And uh, I got to know this guy, and I said, not only was he a big deal in the past, but he continues to be somebody that knows God and is used by God even in his later years. And I just saw this difference between really, like, when we're younger, it doesn't look like there's much of a difference. Like a lot of us look like we're doing kind of the same thing. But over the course of a life, it's going to become evident uh, which direction we go. And I've just found there's a lot of people who are, uh, actually I keep a list and I try to review them at least every week of seven people I really want to be like one day. They're a list of men and women who are godly, who most of them, I think all of them are older. And uh, they, they just are the kind of people that I describe, that the older they get, the godlier they get. One of them was uh, Mrs. Whitcomb. So I'd, some of you might recognize that name. Her husband was a pastor in the fellowship, and uh, he passed away. We were in our 20s. We got to know her. Uh, she was in her 80s at that time. She's now with the Lord. Every time I was with her, I kind of felt like she was more alive than I was. She was in her 80s. We were in her 20s. I found that she was more like spiritually alive for sure. There was just, whenever we were with her, I was like, how is she like this? I want to be like her one day. Uh, I've got a list of seven people uh, that are like this that I read them, and I think I want to learn to be like them. Now, the Bible actually tells us to do this. In Hebrews 13, 7, it says this, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow a bit more if you're coming to church. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So the writer to the Hebrew says, remember. That's why I have a list of seven people who are like this. I'm trying to remember. And here it says to remember your leaders, especially those who spoke to you the word of God. 
So who was it in your life that spoke God's word to you that really influenced your life, that set an example to you of what it looks like to be a Christian? Remember them. The term remember there, again, I don't want to steal tomorrow's sermon now, but it's not like remember one time. It's on an ongoing basis, bring them to mind. And then it says consider the outcome of their lives. So remember, consider the outcome of their lives. So in other words, Jesus says the tree is known by its fruit. Think about the people whose lives keep getting better and better and better. Consider the outcome of their lives in terms of why, you know what, why do some people finish well? Why do some people get better and better and other people get worse and worse? Something that terrifies me is they say that only 30% of leaders finish well. I don't know where they get that statistic from, but I've certainly found that I've looked around at my buddies. You know, we entered ministry. I was 23, I think. By the way, I had no business being a pastor. I was 20 years old, and I uh, came into a church, and I'm like, I'm here now. Uh, you know, I'll tell you guys, I'll preach about marriage, preach about how to raise kids and all this stuff, and they're like, are you kidding me? Like, maybe you need to, you know, grow up a little bit first. But anyway, I was 23, and I became this pastor, and now I'm 55, and so 32 years later, I realize a lot of my buddies who started with me, some of them have taken their lives. Uh, some of them have just like changed their theology and uh, walked away from core doctrines. Some of them have made a mess of their lives. What is it about people, some people that they get to the finish and they're still running well? So consider the outcome of their lives. Who are the people that are running well? And then it says to imitate their faith. There we go. So Hebrews 13 verse 7 says, uh, to remember them, consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. And that's what I want to do today. Uh, I've been building up for this session. Everything that we're doing is preparatory to now. These are basically the habits of people who, I think, make it to the end and are continuing to grow, continuing to thrive, continue to love Jesus. I think as I read the list of seven people in my life that one day I want to be like, these are the things that characterize what they're like. Um, now, we've just talked about some of the things they do that are kind of boring but necessary. You know, they make time in their lives for God. They rest. They care for their bodies. They simplify and prioritize. But that's just setting the table, as we said. If you do those things, you will not become a godly person. You'll become a less busy, maybe less stressed person, maybe more physically fit, but not a godlier person. So all of that is simply preparatory. But here are the habits, I think, that really make a difference. Now, I want to pause here and say, uh, I had a good question over lunch about, are you, like, what's God's role and our role in this? Which is a very good question. Uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail with this. I could say a lot about this. Here's what I think. The habits themselves are not the point, okay? So even though I'm talking about habits, the habits are only means to an end. The habits are only servants to get us to a certain point, and that point is Jesus. So, in other words, never focus too much on the habits. If you focus too much on the habits, you're completely missing the point. The habits are only to get you to Jesus. So, one way I like to talk about this is, you know, in the Bible, a group of people who are really good at habits, who completely miss the points, their point? Anybody think of them? What are they called? They were amazing at habits, and Jesus is right there. And he says, you guys have mastered the habits, well done, but you've completely missed the point. Like, I am the point here, and you've I'm here before you, and you've completely missed the point. So, on the one hand, the habits are only means to an end. So, the way I like to put it is, uh, they are not, they are a means to go to the things that God blesses. So, God has promised to bless certain things. The habits are a way to get to the things that God promised to bless. And that's what I want to talk about today, the, some of the things that habits um, bring us to. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go on. Maybe if you have questions about that, we can go on Q&R. But here's the other thing I'll say. Uh, if you're a pastor here, you've heard this before. Somebody comes to you and says, Pastor, I'm not growing. Pastor, I'm not growing. I've been coming to the church. I'm switching churches because I'm not growing. And what I found is whenever I talk to somebody who's not growing, by the way, when they come to you, what they're saying, uh, Josh, you, have you ever had this happen to you? 
What they're saying is basically, here's what they're saying. Pastor, I'm not growing and it's your fault. Okay, That's what they're actually saying. And you're like, man. But here's what I found every single time. If you ask them, are you practicing these core habits? Every single time somebody stopped growing, it's been because they've stopped practicing these core habits. Every time. There's a saying that uh, godly people are easily fed, which I think is a true statement. If you're a godly person, you can be listening to, I would say, um, I don't want to say, I'll, I'll just say mediocre sermons. I think if you're a godly person, you can listen to an okay preacher and still find in things in there that are like, oh, I needed to hear that. God, because you're looking at God's word, you're still, so it's actually a sign of immaturity if you're saying, you know, pastor's not doing a good job. Usually it's a breakdown on one of these habits. Here's the flip side. I talked about these people that grow spiritually. Every time I've looked at what they've done, they practice these core habits. So I hope you see the tension here. The habits aren't the point. You can be a Pharisee about these habits and completely miss Jesus. On the other hand, I don't know anybody who's growing who doesn't practice these habits. Everyone I know who gets stuck spiritually stops practicing these habits that I'm going to talk about. So what are these habits? Uh, let me just give them to you today, uh, four of them. And these, this is really, if you don't hear anything today, if you tune out everything I've said, this is really the heart of what I want to talk to you today. Like everything up till now has been to get us to this point. Here's the four things that are critical that you do in your life. And they're so simple, but so essential. Number one, growing believers engage the Bible. Growing believers engage the Bible. You probably heard of the Southern Baptists. They have an organization called Lifeway Research. One thing about Southern Baptists is they have a lot of money, and they fund a lot of good studies that we get the benefit from. And they said, okay, why don't we do a study to find out, you know, pastors get up there every Sunday and say, you guys need to pray. You guys need to read the Bible. You guys need to attend church. You guys need to evangelize. You guys need to do this. They said, I wonder if you took all the things that pastors encourage believers to do. You need to serve in the church. You need to, if you took all of those things, I wonder which of those behaviors is correlated with spiritual growth. So here's all the things. You need to do this, 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 this. Which ones actually make the biggest difference in spiritual growth? Here's what they found. The goal of reading, the behavior of reading the Bible on a regular basis was at the top of the list, the greatest predictor to maturity for spiritual maturity. In other words, if you said, what is the number one activity that you can do that is correlated with spiritual maturity, it's being a person who regularly is in God's word. They found this, the more frequently an individual reads the Bible, the higher he or she will score on all the output goals of spiritual maturity. Put another way, I'm quoting word for word, reading your Bible positively affects your ability to consistently obey God and deny self, serve God and others, share Christ, exercise your faith, seek God, and build relationships and be unashamed about your faith. And here's the surprising part about the study. It didn't say that, it didn't find that studying the Bible was correlated with spiritual growth. Just reading the Bible was correlated with spiritual growth. And the thing I love about this, I was confused by this at first. We have a, I haven't even mentioned him yet. I have a, uh, we have a, a one-year-old, he's like 13 and a half months, uh, grandson. And uh, the thing, he just said uh, his first word, hi, which is a really unusual first word, I think. Hi, like, and he's so, he's like the cutest kid who's ever walked, like far cuter than our kids were. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, I noticed something. We talk, he hardly understands a word we're saying. Like he smiles at us. But I said, if, like, honestly, if you gave him a comprehension test, I don't even know how you do that with a, like, 13 and a half month old. Comprehension is kind of lacking, I would say. And you could say to him, like, what good is it doing that you're there listening to adults talking all the time? Well, you know, from an uh, adult perspective, it's not doing a lot of good. It is, do he's learning so much. 
And every time he listens to us, you know, he's just filling in little bits and details. Very soon, he's going to be blabbing and talking, and we're going to find out what he's been thinking all this time. And it's going to be, I don't know, I think it'll be exciting. I'm not sure. I'll let you know when that time comes. Um, but here's, sometimes we read the Bible, and it's like, I don't know if this is doing me much good, because all these words, I'm only getting one out of maybe 20. I don't understand them. It's hard. Here, I think it's a lot like being a baby, where you're, you don't realize it, but you're learning the vocabulary of scripture. You're entering a world that is foreign to you. And every time you enter it, the more time you spend there, I really wish, by the way, I, I was saying to Shar, I wanted to go into French immersion. And my mother was worried that, you know, back then French immersion was new. She wasn't sure. I think just being in a stuck, stuck in a class where I didn't know the language at all and being sitting there and just like, I don't understand anything that's going on at all. I think I would have learned it very quickly. And that's the way we learn. That's what happens in the Bible. You enter into scripture and you don't even have to understand it. Just being there, you begin to become fluent over time and learn the language and it begins to change you. So if you want to grow, if you want to be somebody who is one of the people that the older you get, the godlier you get, the number one behavior that you can take is to regularly read your Bible. So do you want the bad news now? According to the Canadian Bible League, guess how many Christians are reading their Bible every week? One in seven Canadian Christians. And I hesitate to say that because I know that, uh, I, I know that it's very easy to give a guilt trip. And uh, if you walk away feeling guilty, I failed in my role. Because I think if I could, if I could make you all feel guilty, that wouldn't lead to positive change, right? Conviction is one thing, guilt is another thing. So I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty. All I'm saying is the number one behavior associated with spiritual growth is also the one that six out of seven Christians are not doing regularly. So here's my encouragement. And it is so crucial, The probably the most strategic thing you can do. Read your Bible. And again, remember I said make time, 10 to 15 minutes every day? Do you realize that all it takes is, if you want to read the Bible cover to cover, over two years, all it takes is seven minutes a day. So 15 minutes a day, seven minutes a day. And I love, we live in a great age of, there's audio Bibles, there's one-year Bibles, there's two-year Bibles, there's uh, Bible apps, there's uh, podcasts. If you don't even want to read the Bible yourself, but you commute to work, you can find a podcast where they actually read the Bible for you, and you can read it every day. There's, uh, you can get together groups, there's amazing apps, uh, we live in a golden age. There's study Bibles. There's so many resources to make this happen. But the number one thing you can do is just say, I'm going to develop the habit of regularly reading the Bible myself, not just in church myself. One of my goals is to become a Psalm 1 person. Um, and I actually told my agent, you know, I want to write a book, The Psalm 1 Life. And he says, horrible title. Nobody will read it. Nobody, like, you need to, the two... I'm like, I don't care. I, lo I just want to live a Psalm 1 life. So I don't think I'll ever write a book about it, but here's a Psalm 1 life. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man, the woman, who delights in the law of God. Not just reads it, but delights in the law of God and meditates on it day and night. Um, day and night, it's not like it, all you do is sit all day and think about scripture. I think what it's saying is, like if I said to Shar. Uh, I'm thinking about you all day. Like, I just, you're always on my mind. What she would understand, I'm not just sitting. Like, I'm actually doing my work, right? I'm not just sitting there thinking I can't work today because I'm thinking about Shar. But what she would understand that as I'm doing my work, I'm, she's never far from my thoughts. Like, I'm always thinking of her. I think that's what the psalmist is saying. Like, do your job, raise your kids, being an accountant, be a teacher, whatever it is. But as you're doing it, the word of God is never far from your mind. Psalm 1 says, as you do this, you will be a tree, like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. That's what I want for my life. I want to be a Psalm 1 person. I love the, uh, when Spurgeon described, uh, I think it was John Bunyan, he said, uh, John Bunyan was so full of scripture that if you, if you cut him, like if he was walking in a Somehow he got cut going down the pathway like a, a branch or something cut him. 
the Bible would come out. That's how much his life was full of the Bible. And he said, you know, Bunyan could hardly speak without some form of the Bible coming out. One of the people I look up to in life the most, uh, he's known for his wisdom. And oftentimes people will say to him, how did you get so wise? Because you just speak to him and he's so wise. And he says, well, the answer is I've memorized uh, the book of Proverbs. And I go like, okay, show off, like, come on. And he says, then he goes on and he says, in Japanese. So I'm like, okay, way too much. <laughs> but I guess what I'm saying is, it ha being in the word of God to that extent actually shapes, like it just starts to come out of you. So please, number one habit you can develop, read the Bible, read the Bible. So here we go. Number two habit. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to warn you here, this is uh, my opinion, LifeWay, this is not from LifeWay research. In fact, this contradicts LifeWay research, but I'm going to make an argument for it too. The second habit that growing believers cultivate is they speak with God. And where do I get that from? Well, a number of verses, but here I love this passage. And again, if we looked at the... Uh, tense of the verbs. It's ask on an ongoing basis, and it will be given to you. Seek, not one time, but seek on an ongoing basis, and you will find. Knock. On, in other words, Jesus is talking about the habit of prayer. Not a one-time prayer, but this is what you're supposed to be doing on an ongoing basis. And as you keep praying to God, then Jesus promises that as you ask, it will be given. As you seek, you'll find. As you knock, it will be opened to you. Jesus wants us to be in the habit of continually telling God what's on our minds, bringing everything to him. Now, here's the thing about prayer. I, there was a guy at our church who was going through a divorce. And uh, he said, can I meet with you? And sure. So I began to pray with him. And I said, Lord, be with my friend here. Like, give him. And I kind of felt like my prayer was average. And so then he began to pray. He's like, can I pray too? And he began to pray, and I felt like I was in the middle of something holy because he was so desperate for God in the middle of his pain that the prayer just flowed out of him. And I said, I don't know what I just did, but I know that he just prayed. There's a sense in which when, we're, when our backs are against the wall, prayer comes very easily to us. Is that true in your life? It's true in my life. When you're in trouble, prayer just happens. But you know, when our life is not that bad, prayer is difficult. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Isn't it interesting that we have the ear of the God of the universe that wants to hear from us, and somehow we find prayer difficult to realize that we can talk to God about anything, and actually God cares and listens to us, and yet we find prayer really, really difficult. But I've just noticed that people I know who are growing spiritually and are becoming the kind of person I want to become They've actually cultivated this uh, dialogue with God where they're telling him about what's going on in their lives. I love in Paul Miller's book, uh, this book changed my life. It's called The Praying Life. I don't know why it changed my life. It just, it was so, it helped me so much. He was talking about his daughter. He was having problems with his daughter. Uh, and so he was trying to figure out the way to handle her. And he was trying everything like Go back to bed. Like she could get to up too early and be too loud and he'd get really frustrated. So he tried all these behavioral things. And after a while, he was the funny thing is he was doing his devotions in the morning and he hears his daughter get up and he's like, this is crazy. Like she shouldn't be up. She knows she shouldn't be up. So he's like, tries discipline. He tries all these different approaches. And eventually one day it hit him. You know, the one thing that I haven't tried is actually praying about this situation. And so he did. He began to pray like God, I've tried everything, like, would you please help my daughter? Because I don't know what to do. And it doesn't always work this way, but actually that was the one thing that in that case helped his daughter and completely saw a change around. And based on that, he said, what if instead we saw, instead of seeing prayer as something we add to our lives, what if we saw prayer as actually how we live our lives? So in other words, um, prayer isn't just something we do once in a while, like, Lord, bless my day. But when you're at work planning a meeting, what about the way that you plan your meeting is actually praying? Like, God, I'm working on planning this meeting right now. Uh, what about if we put this here? 
And then item two here, you know, what about this discussion? We take this approach with it. Uh, when you're going to work, like what about instead of praying before you go to work, what about just keeping an ongoing relationship with God? Um, we live in, you know, weird times. Uh, we had a couple that was, uh, she lived in Liberty Village in Toronto and her fiance lived in West Virginia. And uh, what they would do, because they were so far apart, is they would get their tablets and they would just open FaceTime and uh, they'd be like, she'd be washing her dishes and he'd be on FaceTime like doing laundry. And they'd forget that they were even like on the call with each other, but once in a while they would speak and it would, oh, like I forgot you were there. And they would continue the conversation throughout the day. What if we just treated prayer like that, where it's like, okay, in the morning, God, I'm just going to keep this open with you all day. And at times I might forget that you're there, that we've started this conversation. But just throughout the day, I'm going to pick up and talk to you about what's going on. I've just noticed the people I know who are growing, prayer is still hard for them, but they speak with God about everything that's on their lives. Uh, one thing that I've found has really helped me, I have a problem with thinking my prayers have to be uh, kind of neat for God to hear them. Uh, I was talking to some people at this table here. I love the Anglican liturgy. Like one, one reason why I'm drawn to the prayer book is, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like my prayers are so inarticulate and then I pick up the Book of Common Prayer and I go like, oh, are the uh, Puritans have got a few books like this, um, Piercing the Darkness or the Valley of Vision. I'm like, the words are amazing. Like it just puts, and I, I think that my words have to be as articulate as those. And what I'm learning is actually, as I think it's R.C. Sproul said, God fixes our prayers on the way up. We can come to God with messy prayers and just say, God help, like I need you right now. They don't even have to be impressive prayers and God hears them. So yeah, number two habit, growing believers speak with God. Growing believers speak with God. Number three, growing believers worship and belong. And here I'm talking about church. So everyone I know who's growing spiritually, um, they're in God's word. They're regularly praying with God. And they're also part of a church. Growing Christians... Uh, this is going back to LifeWay. Growing Christians uh, do a couple of things in the context of church. So LifeWay research found uh, the number one behavior is reading the Bible. I kind of inserted prayer there just because I felt like convictionally I had to. But I'm going against what LifeWay research said. So LifeWay research said, actually, there's here's the second and third behavior that's correlated with spiritual growth. The number two behavior is if you want to really grow spiritually, the second most strategic behavior you can take is show up at worship services. Now, isn't it interesting? Because in our culture today, people say, don't go to church, be the church. Uh, we don't need more sermons. We just need more action. Well, the data, I'd say scripture and the data show that actually going to church is very important. And who knew, right? Because what do you do when you come to church? You sit under God's word. You sing. By the way, like, thank you for the um, ministry of music this morning. I don't know how many, or today, I don't know how many times I've gone to church, and it felt like my soul has been just so dry to God. And then we begin singing, and something happens in the music where it just feels like uh, a thaw, like my, my, my heart was so frozen, and it begins to melt. And even today, the words, the, the songs that you picked and just leading it, I don't know if you went through this experience today, but as you begin to sing, something happens because God created us to, isn't it interesting that uh, God has made singing such a central uh, thing in the Christian life? One of my friends just wrote a book. I love the title. It's Sing Loud, Die Happy. I, what a brilliant title. Sing Loud, Die Happy. One of the keys to and that's what happens when we come to gather as a church. We sing. We need to sing. And then if, if you, as you do at this church, if you have a pastor who loves the word of God, that pastor opens up the word of God. I always tell our congregation, the minute I begin to just give you my opinion, stop listening. The minute I, I point to a passage of scripture and I say, thus says the Lord, like look at verse three, look at what God is saying here. The authority doesn't come from me. The authority comes from God's word. And something happens when a church gathers and a faithful preacher gets up and 
says, look at this passage. Let's talk about it together. How does this apply to our lives? And it's preached. And I love the, I love seeing, uh, I go to churches, the churches that encourage me. I just see everybody leaning forward as the word is preached and they're just ready. They come ready to hear God's word. And then afterwards we go out to the foyer and, uh, I've just noticed some people are so good at this. They look at you. They say, how are you doing? And they actually listen to the answer. And, or they come up to you and they say, I just wanted to encourage you. And they have exactly. Is it any wonder that God uses Sunday, Sunday services to bless us? Look at what we do when we gather here. So many important things happen. So don't let anybody tell you that church is optional for Christian growth. It is essential for Christian growth. Uh, and don't let anybody tell you that you don't need to show up. You, don't, you just need to be the church. No, if you look at the, it sounds good. Yes, we do have to be the church. But in order to be the church, you've got to gather as the church. And so it's so important. It's so crucial. But here's the other thing LifeWay found. So number one behavior was reading scripture. They found out, number two, that people who uh, go to church regularly grow spiritually. The number three was actually not just go to church, but are actually part of a community in the church. In other words, they don't just go and sit in rows, but at some point in the church, they actually are in relationship with brothers and sisters encouraging each other. So in other words, for Lifeway, they said going to a Sunday school class or going to a small group, going to a prayer meeting, going to whatever, going to youth group, uh, actually being known and encouraging each other is so crucial for spiritual growth. And no wonder, again, because Ephesians 4 talks about the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when it, each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You were never meant to grow alone. You were meant to uh, worship and live together. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is uh, just people don't go to church as faithfully as they used to. And I think if you want to turbocharge your spiritual growth, like make, make it a point of going to church. Uh, this is going to be for Bible geeks. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce was a, a commentator of scripture who's like, he's he famed. Like if you go to, you know F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, if you go to a pastor and say, do you know who F.F. F. Bruce is? Chances are they'll know. So one of our friends was at a little church in England and there was this old man at the back door and every week he'd be there handing out bulletins like, nice to see you, you know, here's your bulletin. And just going in. One day says, somebody says to him, do you know where that guy is at the door that hands you bulletins every week? That is F.F. Bruce. That is like a famed, renowned Bible scholar. And he just shows up. He's a churchman. He just shows up faithfully week after week at the church and serves. And okay, no wonder he was known for his amazing commentaries and his walk with God. Because he was, he just, wherever he went, he plugged into a local church and he's like, let me serve here. Uh, he was in the word of God. He prayed and he showed up at a church. So yeah, I just love that story of like, nobody's above that. Uh, we never get beyond that. Okay. And here's uh, the last one, which is uh, so crucial here. The last thing I noticed that growing believers do is they adapt these habits into their lives. What they adapt these habits into their lives. So here's what I'm talking about. One day I stood in front of the church. I said, okay, everybody, I found a Bible reading program. We're all going to do it. And uh, it's going to be amazing. Like we're all going to read the scripture the same time. And it's just going to be amazing. So I thought it was going well. Uh, Shardine comes to me a few months into it. And she says, uh, and I, this is where, like, I need my wife. I'm so thankful for my wife. She comes to me a few months in. She says, Daryl, you've ruined my devotional life. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? She said, I actually had something going that was working for me. Like, I had found a way that I was reading the Bible. It was really helping me grow. It fit my life. And you came along and imposed what works for you and told me that I have to follow your way of reading the Bible. And she says, now I've got to kind of find my way back to what was working for me because you impose the way that works for you on me and it's ruined my devotional life. So a lot of pastors get up and say, look, if you want to walk, if you want to serve the Lord, you've got to get up at six in the morning 
and you need to spend the first hour in prayer. The problem is, if you're an evening person, or if you've got kids that are up at six and need to get to school, maybe six isn't the best time for you to be doing that. Maybe an hour is too long, right? Maybe if you've got young children or you're at a stage of life where it's just too busy, maybe you need 15 minutes or 10 minutes. But somebody getting up and saying, this is a way that I found works for me and you've got to do it the same way is actually death to a lot of us. Uh, one day I was teaching this material at a church. About this time in the day, the pastor said, Daryl, he didn't say this, but this is what I heard. He'd be like, Daryl, we're tired of hearing from you now. You've been speaking all day. So you're going to go sit over there and shut up. And uh, he did something smart at that point. He said, basically, we've heard enough from Daryl. He got up a group of people. He had a senior citizen. He had a young mother. He had a college student. Um, he had a busy executive. And he said, okay, um, we've heard Daryl teach all this content today. Now I want to ask you, you're a, busy, you're a busy executive. How are you finding time in your life to read the Bible and pray? You're a mother. You've got a busy family with kids. How are you finding time to go to church every week? Um, you're, you know, you're on the road all the time, or you, now you've got all kinds of time. Like, how are you doing it? And what was interesting was all of them were doing it, but all of them were doing it differently. So what I want to do right now is give you permission to experiment. You don't need to do it the way that I do it. You need to do it, but you don't need to do it the way that I do it. If you're an extrovert, don't try to do this alone. Experiment with getting a friend and buddying up and doing it. If you're an extreme introvert, don't try to do it with a group. <laughs> if you thrive on alone time, then find a way to give yourself alone time in God's word, in prayer. If you are... Uh, I don't know, if you are a busy person, be okay with 10 minutes. You know, again, you can read the Bible in seven minutes a day. Over two years, you'll have read the Bible cover to cover. Show up at church every week. And I, I love this. Uh, I love the fact that the Lord's Prayer, uh, I think which is a guide, a template to prayer, only takes a few minutes to pray. And if you keep this tab open on your life, uh, I, I heard a pastor, Mark Dever, recently, and somebody said, what does your devotional look, life look like? And he says, which day? And uh, they said, no, oh, well, like, maybe today. And he said, well, you know, sometimes I pray for half an hour in the morning. Sometimes it's 30 seconds, because that's all I got that day. And that, that, that was like, a, it gave me permission to say, find what works for you in that particular day and make it happen. One of the things I'm learning is actually, uh, it's okay to experiment and have fun. God is not opposed to you enjoying your devotional life. God is not a, it's not like you get extra points for making it miserable for yourself. And so find a time, like if you are an evening person, do it in the evening. Uh, if music helps you, then put on some music, but find a way that works for your life and build it into your life. What I've realized is actually a lot of people who teach on these are geared one way. Uh, and the reality is all of us have different personalities and life demands so find what works for you and customize it for your life. All of this is so basic. I began the day by saying spiritual growth is not about doing like huge things. And, you know, it's about doing these small things consistently. I want to go back to the beginning and say, God, God's heart for you is that you would enjoy a relationship with him. A relationship that is going to be honestly enough to sustain you through how hard life is. I've had the joy of walking with senior saints at the worst moments of their life. Um, I've, I've sat in hospital rooms where, like, a wife is saying goodbye to her husband of, of 60 years. I've seen in those moments, you know how we sing, Christ is enough for me, Christ is enough for me? I've actually seen in, in those moments, there's people who actually, in those moments, it's true. Christ is enough for them. They've walked with God over such a long period of time that even in the worst circumstance of life, they're like, this is hard. It's brutal. I'm, I feel crushed. But Christ is enough. I still have him. Friends, this morning, or this, this afternoon, God wants you to be so satisfied in him that you've just got this ballast in your soul. 
that no matter what happens, even in the hardest circumstances, you know he's with you. He has not abandoned you. Uh, I want you to experience that. I want you to become more like you. The godlier that we become, the more like Christ we become, the more like us we become. Like It's almost like God removes the clutter from, it's like these home makeover shows where they take away all the, uh, like somebody's, there's beautiful wood and somebody's painted over it with this cheap thing and they strip it and say, look at what's underneath. It's almost like God comes and says, I'm going to show you what I made you to be in the first place. I'm going to remove all the sin, all that sin is done. I'm going to remove, I'm going to strip all that down and you're going to see you for the first time. The real you is going to come out. And not only that, as I said, you're going to, your impact on others is going to be multi-generational. But what does it take? It actually just takes being a person of God's word and being a person who talks to him, being a person who shows up at church and being a church a person who learns how to fit all of this into your life. Um, so that's it. I mean, I said to somebody one time, I'm so embarrassed. Like I've written two books that basically say, um, read your Bible, <laughs> pray, you know, maybe consider going to church, you know, so simple. And yet, as I said, whenever I've seen somebody who's not growing, it's because one of those things has stopped. And whenever I see somebody who continues to grow, it's because they're pursuing Jesus by doing those things. So we're going to have a Q&A in a minute. I just want to pray that this would be our reality, that God would build these habits into our lives. And in doing so, um, we would pursue him. So Father, this is so basic. Um, I confess that in all of this, our greatest desire is that not that we would become great habit keepers. Our greatest desire is that we would become great Jesus pursuers. Lord, that all these habits would just simply be ways of going after Jesus. And I thank you that we never have to run that hard after Jesus because he's not running away from us. He promises that those who seek him will find him. Lord, we believe that you're more ready to enjoy relationship with us than we are ready to enjoy relationship with you. Lord, you are more ready to respond to us than many times we are to respond to you. My prayer is that all of us uh, in this room would see our lives transformed over years as we just spend time in your word, as we spend time praying to you about everything that's going on in our life. Lord, as we just show up at church, as we find ways to, to build these habits into our lives and change them according to our needs. So again, Lord, our, our prayer is that in all of us that we would meet you. I want to thank you for Jesus. He's far more beautiful than anything else we could talk about today. Lord, there's nobody worth pursuing more than Jesus. Uh, Lord, of everything, anything that we could talk about, I don't think there's a better topic we could talk about than Jesus. And thank you that we don't have to talk about him as a topic because we get to know him as a person. We get to enjoy the love that he has for us, and in return, we get to love you. As we sang that song earlier, um, if ever I loved you, my Jesus, it's now. Lord, I pray that that would be the prayer that the song that we get to sing, and every time we sing it, it becomes more and more true. That every time we sing it, where our love for you is increased from the last time we sung it. So, Lord, this is our prayer. Um, thank you that you uh, love us, and I uh, pray that you would help us to pursue you using these habits. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.